Good morning. Get the energy back into the room. I'm thrilled to be here today. Uh, when I was asked if I wanted to have an opportunity to participate in this event, I had a few questions. I wanted to know if I would be given the chance to walk and talk at the same time. They said yes. I said great. Lots of energy on this topic. What do you want me to talk about? They said, we'd like to talk about how do we improve the health of our communities. And I thought to myself, obviously, how many days am I going to be walking and talking? They said, you've got about 10 minutes or less. So here is improving the health in our communities in 10 minutes or less. We're going to get to as much of the insight as we possibly can. Um, I'm Brian Pennick. As Kimmy said, I'm the president and CEO of Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. We are the state's largest not-for-profit, mission-driven health plan proudly serving millions of people in every county, in every community in Maryland. And I'm thrilled to hear the conversations that have come before me today. I'm even more excited to hear what's going to come next, because I believe that everything that we need exists in this room. The knowledge, the ability, the decision making, as one audience member pointed out earlier, the problem solving, we have what we need in this room today. But as I was talking to some of the folks on the next panel in the green room getting ready for this, one of the questions that hung in the air is, what, are we, what comes of events like this? What happens after we have these conversations? And I think that is the key question in front of us today. Because far more than anything that we say today, far more than our dialogue, what will matter most are the actions that we commit to take tomorrow. The change that we agree to facilitate tomorrow. The work that we will do next to propel this state forward together. And you heard all the elements of this throughout the morning already. Collaboration, data-driven decision-making, getting in front of problems and challenges, and not just cleaning up the mess on the back end. These are all of the things that we need, not just to affect gun violence in our community and climate change, but a better overall state of health. They're all the building blocks, the component pieces, the bricks that we lay in our path. And so I was trying to think, how would I relate this personally, beyond the work that we do, the effort that we're going to facilitate? And I reflected on my own life and how I got to this point, this conversation today. I was born in Philadelphia. I'm the youngest of two boys 21 months apart. I've adopted the O's and the Ravens in the eight years that I've been here, but when I hear go birds, my heart still screams eagles. I, I know, I know. It could be worse, it could be the Steelers. But that identity and that personal connection to community, that's part of who I am. And it's part of the reason I love Maryland. It's part of the reason I love Baltimore, because that lives here in this community. And when we were growing up, my parents invested in my brother and I. And it wasn't always easy. My father was a mechanic for a utility company. He was the night emergency man. He was a naval reservist. And on the weekends, he did tree work to make a little extra money. My mother delivered bundles of newspapers for paper routes. She was a school bus driver. She was the recess attendant. And she took the civil service exam and eventually became a letter carrier for the United States Postal Service. Neither of my parents are college educated. What they gave us was work ethic. What they gave us was a sense of imagination and possibility. What they invested in us was an environment that enabled our path to be clear. They created the construct around us that allowed us to move in our lives. They saved their money to put encyclopedias on the bookshelf. And when we didn't know something, my mother would point. We'd go and we'd grab a book. It's before Google, folks. We'd look up whatever we didn't know my mother would have us share it back with her. Formal education wasn't part of our process, wasn't part of our journey, but learning was. To this day, my mother is the only non-clinician I know who has a copy of the physician's desk reference in her library 
and actually reads it. Our path was made clear. And so when it became time for my brother and I to make our way through life, we took that mindset, we took that ethic, we took what they poured into us, and we moved forward. And when we graduated from high school, each of us entered the workforce. I have learned to code out of a book. And at 18 years old, I was hired as a contractor for a healthcare company. The encouragement of someone in my life that saw my path with greater clarity than I could possibly see it at 18 years old. And I joined that organization and possibilities just exploded in front of me. I got an education of what it looked like to participate in a white collar work environment for the first time. For me, the smell of oil and sawdust reminds me of my dad. Newsprint and wet cardboard, sorry mom, reminds me of my mother. This is a first experience for me. But in that environment, possibilities were clear. The way was clear. And people encouraged me to continue to move and progress based on my merits and contributions. And invested in me. I enrolled in a local community college who met me where I was, working a full-time job. And eventually, after 20 years of full-time work and part-time education, I became a first-generation college graduate. My path to this stage was not straight. But it wasn't blocked either. It was not blocked either. We had a roof over our heads, always. We had food on our plates, always. It wasn't always what we wanted. My mother would make us sit there until we finished our dinner, even if that meant being there at seven o'clock the next morning. We had clothes on our backs. My mother would set aside $20 every summer so that my brother and I could get a new pair of sneakers before we went into the next school year. One year she told us if we could earn the difference, she'd let us buy any shoes we wanted. And I can remember the day that my mother stood in the shoe store and cried because my brother and I left with a $100 pair of sneakers. But we had shoes, we had clothes, we had what we needed. We had a safe environment. We had the luxury to imagine that our circumstances could be better and different than what we experienced during our childhood. And when we entered out into systems and structures of people, into corporations, when we confronted community and government, our paths were not inhibited by racism. Our paths were not inhibited by discrimination or bias. No, quite the opposite. People could imagine the possibility of me being successful in realizing the American dream. We were aided along the way. So you might be thinking to yourself, what on earth does this have to do with healthcare? And I would say everything, or at least the majority of things. 80% of my health, the future of my health, the health of my three children, Every person in this audience, everyone that you know, is informed by social and environmental circumstances. Where you are born into, where you are raised, the environment, systems, and structures that you participate in and confront, sometimes that confront you. This, more than anything else, informs our health. And so you might imagine if 80% of health and healthcare and state of health and the future of health is informed by social and environmental circumstances, that must be, because the data tells us, where we're investing the most. But we're not. But we're not. Today in this country, we spend 18.3% of GDP on healthcare. Folks, that is $4.7 trillion annually. If every seat in this hall was filled, 
and every one of you got a piece of that health care spend, you'd all leave here today multi-billionaires before taxes. There is a massive amount of weight in this economy that can be leveraged for good, for bad, to affect change in trajectory along these issues. But we have yet to find the courage, the change, the urgency to take all of the things that you heard earlier today and everything that you're gonna hear about this afternoon and bring them together and to think differently about the trajectory of human lives and communities and our state as a whole. This is the opportunity in front of us. This is the urgency that we have to have because we're not moving forward effectively today. What comes of this? The urgency to change. We've got to confront these issues in new and different ways. And everything that we need is here, in the audience today, on the stage today, as an extension of the organizations in the public and private sector that each of us represent, ready to move together. Because we're all doing the work individually, we need to come together with common purpose. And we need to think about this for what it is. What we do will largely enable or disable human beings in local communities. We'll ensure that the investment that we make in healthcare is leveraged to longer, healthier lives, not true today, or if we'll fail to meet that challenge because we can't set things down. And so my ask, my encouragement to all of us is to see this today in a new way and to wake up tomorrow ready to act urgently differently. That is the big idea. And if we do that, it's even bigger impact. Thank you so much for your time today.